information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Foundation podcast with Dominic Frisby, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. I'm talking today to Andy Duncan. Andy writes the Austrian economics based blog, The God That Failed, which you can fa- find at thegodthatfailed.org. He's also a private lecturer in derivatives in the banking industry. Andy, hello. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you today. Um, I have to say, I really enjoy your blog. Um, the first question I, I want to ask you, you're, you're kind of a, a self-taught Austrian economics, uh, Austrian economist, I should say. Um, so, and, uh, in the course of this, um, show, we're going to talk about what, what the, the best books on Austrian economics are. That's going to be the subject of our, of our chat. But I just want to start by just tell me a little bit about your background and how, how you came to all of this, because you're a, a fairly recent convert, I think. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say I was an Austrian economist, but I've been on quite a road. It was a road from socialism. So about 10 years ago, I was a full-time hardcore activist in the kind of Labour Party socialist kind of arena. But I had lots and lots of questions. This was the kind of time of Tony Blair and uh, the kind of Peter Mandelson generation. And I was part of the Marxism Today movement that was behind all of that. But I had lots of questions and there were no, no good answers in socialism. So I kept asking questions to myself and other people and eventually stumbled across various things. 1984, I think, was a big book for me by George Orwell. I then fell into the Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, and then that set off a few more questions. And then I got to sort of things like The Road to Serfdom, um, discovered P.J. O'Rourke, um, Eat the Rich, and more and more questions started developing and developing. And then, you know, this was sort of not quite pre-internet, but very primitive internet. I was an IT contractor, so I knew a little bit of the internet, probably more than a few other people. I stumbled upon Austrian economics, um, I actually went in too hard. I went in because I'd read his name in Atlas Shrugged. The Ludwig von Mises, I went straight into human action. I didn't want to mess around. Now, that's pretty hardcore for most people to start off with. It's a very dense book, but I, I was kind of driven as a former Stalinist, driven. And I kind of got through human action. And then from then on, a, a light bulb went on or a thousand light bulbs went on. And then I started just voraciously reading all of the rest um, helped enormously by Mises.org, which was going then uh, run by Lou Rockwell and various others, including Jeff Tucker and so on, um, and started reading um, Man, Economy and State, all the Rothbard books, The Ethics of Liberty, For a New Liberty, Conceived in Liberty, um, everything I could get my hands on. I kind of voraciously read them all the time. This is back in the old days of printed books before uh, iPads and Kindles. So that's how I kind of got into this. Maybe five years ago, I'd kind of read most things. And ever since then, I've just been reading bits and pieces and reading uh, uh, Hezus Huertu de Soto and various other writers. And now I write book reviews occasionally for Mises.org when my, when my kind of business doesn't take up too much of my time. So I do book reviews for Mises.org and I write my own little blog. I only put things on there which I need to put on there. I kind of do it on a has to go on my website kind of basis. Um, but what I'd like to try and do is help educate people because I see you're much more of an optimist than I am about Britain. I see Britain maybe going down a bit more of a, of a tunnel than, than you do. Uh, and I just want to have a, a point of information for people to, to read, to, to cling on to, hopefully, to educate themselves and, and to find out that there is another alternative apart from socialism. It's very interested to hear you talk on um with the, on your podcast recently with the Occupy London movement. Mm-hmm. And there was lots of very intelligent people you interviewed. And they were saying all the same silly things that I used to say 10 years ago. And it was amazing for me to hear that, that I used to share those views. And I, I just wanted those people to be given a, a place where they can find information to help them overcome those stumbling points in their thinking. Excellent. OK, now, so let's uh, go through your favourite books on this uh, Austrian economic theme. And I, I see your first on the list. We have the Henry Hazlitt classic economics in one lesson. Yeah, I think we have to go there. There, there are a couple of others by Thomas Taylor, an introduction to Austrian economics and Gene Callan, economics for real people. But I think the number one book, which strangely enough doesn't actually mention Austrian economics, still has to be the classic economics in one lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Now, the one lesson is this politician stands up and says, I'm going to spend a million pounds on X. Everyone goes, wonderful. Isn't that great for X? 
But what the politician forgets about, and so do all the people who are going to benefit from X, is Y. Mr. Y or Mrs. Y is going to have money drained out of them to give to X. And everyone forgets about the Mr. Y or Mrs. Y. So he starts with that lesson and then he builds on that. And he builds up a kind of un unrelenting and cogent kind of argument built upon that first lesson about why minimum wage laws don't work, about rent control doesn't work about all these kinds of questions. And as you read through it, chapter by chapter by chapter, all these kinds of um, scales fall from your eyes. And it's a wonderful book written beautifully clearly by one of the kind of America's top journalists in the 1950s, I think. Uh, wonderful book. Um, it's think... one of the few books on economics that I've actually read. Wow, and, that's uh, right. <laughs> That's a big statement. And I enjoyed reading it. And um, I always find the classic example of, of the, uh, it, he calls it broken window theory, um, is the example of the supermarket that goes to the council to apply for planning permission to build the supermarket uh, just outside of the city centre. And if we build this supermarket, we're going to build, a, we're going to provide a hundred jobs. But what they don't mention is the fact that the supermarket's going to take away more than a hundred jobs from the high street and the local businesses. And that that's your, that, yeah. that's the, the kind of his theory in a nutshell, I always thought. I think the classic case was last year with London, with the riots in London. And people say things like this, um, a window of a shop gets smashed, that's great for the glazier. So the glazier will come in and make £100 fixing someone's window. What we usually forget about, though, is the guy who owns the shop, who's lost £100, which he would have bought a suit with otherwise. So we forget about the shopkeeper, yeah. we think about the glazier. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, yeah, he, he could have improved his own shop or spent... The, exactly. And... Uh, and uh, um, anyway, so let's move on from uh, Hazlitt, number two, The Mystery of Banking by Murray Rothbard. I've only ever read one book by Mothbar Rothbard, which is uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money, which I very much enjoyed. Yeah. Um, but anyway, The Mystery of Banking, tell me about it. This is sort of a bit like What Has the Government Done to Our Money. It's a kind of lighter version. I put this number two because I thought it's slightly lighter. It's sort of, um, it takes you through one of the two crucial parts of Austrian economics, which is the money printing kind of system, how governments took over private money and how they turned it into government fiat money from 1971 onwards. We've lived in a purely fiat money world. How did they do that? How did they go from gold or silver money or something people valued for itself and end up with fiat money? He takes you through that in a briefer way than he does with um, what has the government done to our money. And he does explain the mystery of banking, which most people, even some people in the banking industry, don't sort of realise. Even some people, even a lot of people. I won't go that far because I make <laughs> my living from these, uh, from that kind of industry. But they don't realise that governments and banks just print money out of thin air. Yeah. And this, where did they get the money from? Where did the European Central Bank get 498 billion euros from a few weeks ago? Did they have it in a, in a vault in the ground or did they just create it out of thin air? Murray Rothbard in this Mystery of Banking book explains the mystery of where they got that money from. How long is it? Um, it's, I would say, it, it, it's probably a two or three hours read at full pace. So 50 or 60 pages or something. Maybe a little bit longer than that. It, yeah. It, it, but it's beautifully written. Murray Rothbard um, followed the writing style of a guy called H.L. Mencken, amongst many others, and writes in a beautiful, clear way. Uh, isn't H.L. Mencken the the... St uh, he wrote a book on style. Is that right? He did, I think. I'm not entirely sure about Mencken's background, but um, he... I, yeah, I think he's actually, bizarrely, one of Stephen King's gurus. Ah, you're think thinking of Strunk and White. Ah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah I am. Yeah, 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 Elements, thank you, yes. But, but it, it, H.L. Mencken could easily have fallen into, into that school, and so does okay. Rothbard. Because it's interesting you say how, how well Rothbard and Hazlitt write, because I think, in general, this applies to all books on economics... They are, um, they are not written, uh, as compellingly as they could be. And when you, when a book about economics does appear, um, and it is well written in a language that the layperson is happy to read, they very often very quickly do very well. So I'm thinking, for example, of Tim Harford's book, uh, or Freakonomics, these kind of books. When, when something is, is, is really put, put in everyday language, they, 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 um, can often get pretty quickly onto the bestseller list. And if I have a, Chris, a, a criticism of the Austrian uh, writing, it's that they're not as, as compellingly written as they could be. 
Well, Ludwig von Mises with Human Action, it, it's, it's a very dense book. I mean, he's, we'll come on to that later on, I think, number eight. Um, it's very, very heavy. He's trying to compress the whole of human history, which is quite quite a big feat yeah. in in five or six hundred pages or maybe more. Um, I think Murray Rothbard, though, with his book um, Man, Economy and State, clears up a lot of that denseness and, and clarifies things. We will get to human action, but it is a tough book. And I think the route to human action is through Murray Rothbard, who was a major, the major student of uh, Ludwig von Mises. OK. All right. So number three. OK, you'll like this one because it's nice and short. You can read this one in about half an hour. I actually okay. read this in a Sainsbury's car park um, in Abingdon in about half an hour. You'll love it. Very strangely for, for von Mises, it is very, very short and very, very pithy. And it just talks about how um, people are, are anti-capitalistic, yeah. why they're anti-capitalistic. So you get pop stars saying things like, I hate money, I hate, capital no, I, I hate capitalism, but I love money. Yeah, so this is called, by the way, The Anti-Capitalistic yeah. Mentality. Yeah, The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality by Luke Vermees is perhaps the shortest book he ever wrote. We get lots of things in here. We get about why people turn to socialism when they're trying to ask questions about why things appear wrong. Uh, we get the, the envy, the school of envy coming in there. We get all sorts of um, reasons why intelligent people become socialists and, and how we can help overcome those kind of tendencies. OK, next one, number four. Right, the second major strand of Austrian economics beyond where does this funny money come from is the Austrian um, theory of the trade cycle or the business cycle. Obviously, Gordon Brown which, never which, ever stumbled across this, but oh, <laughs> if only we wish I he had. he abolished it. Now, when you print all this money from thin air, it floods out into the economy and people think they're rich. And this money, though, isn't actually backed by real resources. It's, it's just backed by government promises. So people think they're wealthier than they are and they go and invest in things which ultimately will fail because of a lack of real resources. That then causes the boom and bust cycle. I think in England, 2004, 2005, house prices are going up every day. People feel rich. They're going on expensive holidays, buying expensive cars. Mm -hmm. And then we have the crash in 2008. And people suddenly realize all those investments have all gone wrong mm -hmm. and the government's tried to keep inflating to keep the, the party going. But that is all explained. That business cycle theory, perhaps the only effective one that there is in the world that works by um, the Austrian theory of the trade cycle. Now, this is a series of four or five short essays by von Mises, by Gottfried Habler, Murray Rothbard, and uh, Roger Garrison, and a couple of others, Friedrich Hayek as well, I think. And it, it just explains the Austrian business cycle theory in a very straightforward, simple way, and ties it back to the funny money that's produced in the mystery of banking. Okay, number five, Meltdown by Thomas Woods. Yeah, I thought we'd go a bit more modern. I mean, I could have gone down the classic 1950s, 1960s route, but I thought we'd get a bit more modern. Now, when we did have the crash in 2008, Thomas Woods, um, who's an who's a Austrian historian and economist and a very big speaker in the US, he wrote a fantastic book really quickly called Meltdown, which took the idea of the Austrian business cycle theory and the mystery of banking and explained what caused the kind of Lehman Brothers crash or Lehman Brothers crash um, in this very cogent, very well-written book. Now, one, one of my claims to fame in this is I was listening to a Peter Schiff radio program a few years ago. And a questioner asked Peter Schiff about a, a depression in the 1870s or 80s. And Peter Schiff, strangely, didn't have an instant answer. So I sent, a, I sent an email to Peter Schiff saying that question was explained by Thomas Woods in Meltdown. The next thing I hear, Thomas Woods is speaking on the Radio Schiff radio program as a guest speaker. So hopefully I link those two gentlemen together. So this, it's full of things like that, which ex how Thomas Woods explains how certain things are interpreted by the Keynesians and how they're completely wrong. Yeah. And again, it's, it's very accessible. It's written for what you might call the common intelligent, not the common, the, the kind of intelligent layperson. Nice and clear, beautiful uh, examination of the 2008 crash, what happened and how we could get out of it if we really wanted to. At six, we have... OK, Road to Serfdom by Friedrich Hayek. Again, this is one of the major books which helped me overcome my, um, my suffering of socialism. Um, a, a, a book written in the 40s, which kind of helped explain Stalin and Hitler and their rise. What it's about, it's about government interventions, about how one government intervention leads to another government intervention. Um, so you start off with, say, a free society and one small intervention comes in 
And it, everyone thinks it's great. I don't know what it would be. Helping, helping small children cross roads, whatever it is. Anyway, money has to be taken from someone to pay for these road crossings. And it doesn't work quite properly the way it's intended to. It doesn't work quite out the way we have unintended consequences, which then leads to further regulation and more interventions. Anyway, one intervention, which leads to a degradation of society, leads to another intervention to fix the problem of the first thing going yeah. wrong. You know, the NHS comes in with this unit. That doesn't work, so we need to spend more money on another NHS unit. And that fails, another NHS unit comes in, so we have to fix all these problems. And the monster and Leviathan just grows and grows and grows. And before we know where we are, we're living in a gulag. And uh, in this book, Road to Serfdom, Hayek explains, again, another former socialist, Hayek explains how these interventions go from well-meaning, light socialism all the way through to full, full-blooded um, fascism or, uh, or socialism. I know it's a classic text. I began it, but I didn't finish it. Socialism. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the uh, oh, Road to Serfdom. Serfdom. Yeah, anyway. Oh, well. Let's move on to number seven. We'll move on to number seven. Okay, socialism. I, I, it's one of those I feel I get the idea without having to read the book. Yeah, okay. Well, well there is a good cartoon you can find on the internet, which, uh, which you might find on, on the Road to Serfdom as well. Okay. Okay, that brings us to seven. Now, we can't put it off. I've tried to be, be simple to start with, with um, anti-capitalistic mentality and Road to Serfdom and so on. But eventually we do have to start getting to some heavy stuff. Now, this is particularly good for any former socialists who realise something's wrong with socialism. It's quite a heavy book by, by von Mises. Look at von yeah. Mises. It's just called Socialism. It explains all forms of socialism. National socialism, international socialism, Russian socialism, syndicalism, all of them. And it goes through them all, explains where they all came from and basically talks about why they go wrong and how they go wrong. Now, the major argument in this book, which is explored in great detail, is the economic calculation argument. What that's about is Mises said there were two problems for the socialists. The first problem was who's going to take out the garbage. I mean, we're all, we all want to be pop stars. We all want to be rock stars. We all want to be on television doing great things. We all want to be David Beckham. But who's going to take out the garbage from yeah. David Beckham's house? Now, Mises says, well, well, we'll assume that we've got around that one. We'll assume that there are some people who are happy to take out David Beckham's garbage. And so everyone is doing what they're best at. The second major problem, though, he says, which is insurmountable, is the calculation problem. That is, what do you do with your resources? In a free market, I know what to do because someone will pay me more to do one thing than they will to do another. So I will naturally tend to head towards the thing which gives me more of what I want. Um, price, the price discovery system in a private market with competing people competing for resources will eventually filter through if it's left um, unimpeded by government and will mm -hmm. tell you what you need to do. So in your kind of voice recording industry, there might be 10 jobs on offer from various companies. The one that pays the most will be the one you do for the time available. And that will be because they're prepared to pay you more than anything else because they're, they're offering a better economic product in the long run. So you choose that one. So you always know where to go by the price discovery system. The problem with socialism, of course, is there is no price discovery because the state owns everything. So it just doesn't know what to do. It has these goals. It could, it could do one of 10 things, but it doesn't know which one to do because it has all the resources. So it just, it just chooses one of them on a political whim. It just goes on political whims rather than the best use of scarce resources. Uh, and going on these political whims, they often end up doing the wrong thing. So you end up in the Soviet Union uh, with, you know, nails that weigh 10 tons each because the nail factory has to produce 10 tons of nails. So it does it does one nail. Um, you have you have trees going. Did one, that actually happen? Oh, that happened. And giant cubes of glass. Um, also, you know, there'd be trees being picked in Vladivostok and then sent to Leningrad and trees being picked in Leningrad and sent to Vladivostok. No economic coordination between the two. Now, the Soviet Union actually managed to survive because they could actually see prices in the West. So they copied the West because they could see a fairly free market relatively in the West. So they could copy the prices. But in a totally world global socialist situation, there are no prices. You just do not know what to do with economic scarce resources. Anyway, I've not explained it very well. No, you have. You have. It's explained a lot better in socialism by Ludwig von Mises. Um, it is a bit of a heavy book. I will give you that. But we do have to get a little bit heavy if we want to get a little bit further on. Number eight. 
Ah, well, I was dreading this. Human action by Mr. Um, Mises again. This is the one I started with and maybe I shouldn't have, and, but we do have to get to it. It is the magnum opus of the leading Austrian of the Austrian school. He starts with nothing. He starts with a man on a desert island with nothing. This man has goals. He knows that certain things will help him achieve those goals. He's hungry. He's been washed up. He's got nothing. He's my, absolutely nothing. He's hungry. What does he do? Well, he needs to eat. He knows he needs to eat. Now, from that goal, which he knows he can cure by eating, he seeks food. Um, he finds a coconut thing. He's got to break it open. He needs to find a rock to break open the coconut. Now he's satisfied that goal. He's made himself happy by eating. So now he's got time to find another goal. So he might try and find some fish because he knows fish has more protein than um, coconut. So he needs knowledge. He needs to know his actions will cause things to be better. So his goals are constantly changing. His, his needs are constantly changing. But this man is always going towards his top need and trying to make things happen to, to the best effect for his life. Anyway, Mises starts with this basic axiom that people act to make their life better. They decide what will make their life better. They decide their actions. And he goes from there and he builds the entire structure of human society and civilization f from a series of axioms, which are uncontestable axioms once you go through the book. Now it takes him a thousand pages or something. It's, again, it's all free on Mises.org if you want to download the PDFs or um, eBooks or whatever. So it's fantastic that this resource exists. But he goes from this basic sing symbol axiom that people act, and he goes all the way through to modern life. People trading, mediums of exchange, the invention of money, the invention of stock exchanges. It is dense. It is heavy. There are readers you can download which explain what's going on. Um, the seven books that we've talked about so far will, will build you up to the point where you can get into this. It's an absolute classic Austrian book, and you cannot really say you're an Austrian until you've read it. Dominic. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, number nine. Okay, where are we now? Yes, Man, Economy and State by Murray Rothbard. Now, Murray Rothbard was the, I think, I mean, there were many students of Mises, Hayek and, and, and Springs to mind, but I think Murray Rothbard is the central kind of mainline student of Mises. Now, he wrote his magnum opus, Man, Man Economy and State. By the way, if you do download it from Mises.org, get the one which has power and market in it as well, which, which is a kind of an addendum. And again, he builds on what Mises built in, in human action. He goes a little, he, it's a bit more precise, it's a bit more technical, talks a lot more about indirect exchange, about prices and consumption and rates of interest and how interest rates are determined. And so this would be good for anyone out there who's interested in economics and investment and so on. He goes more into entrepreneurship. Um, it's a little bit less kind of from the basic axioms, he, is, he sort of assumes you've read human action to start with. It is built upon the shoulders of the giant of von Mises, but it's, it's another big, heavy, thick book. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to get you to promise to read this after you've read human action. Uh, but it does, again, cover everything. The reason I say you should get the, the addendum power and market, which comes at the end of the book, it talks about the economics of violent intervention in the market, which is the government. This is where the government... Nor, you can either... If you're hungry and you're living on a desert island, you can go and find a coconut. If no one's previously owned that coconut, you can have the coconut, it's your coconut. Or you can walk to me, I'm gonna call myself Friday on the other side of the island, I've got some fish. And we can exchange coconuts and fish because I'm sick of fish and you're sick of coconuts. Yeah. So because you value the fish more than I value the fish and I value the coconuts more than I value the, the fish, we swap. Mm -hmm. It's not an, not an equal exchange, it's an, it's an unequal exchange. You get what you want. I get what I want. That's that's kind of trade. That's voluntary trade. And then we have another man who lands on the island. He's got a gun. And he points a gun at you and he points a gun at me and he says, right, right, Frisbee, give me one of your coconuts, Duncan, give me one of your fish. And then he consumes those things. We're not better off. And we say to him, well, why, why should we do this? This is because I'm offering you security services and you will accept the security service whether you want them or not. And if you don't like them, I'm going to shoot you. So this is the intervention of the state, supplying security services and other services, which we don't necessarily voluntarily choose to purchase from this man with the gun. So power and market explains all of that and about how government interventions in markets ruin um, economies. And that then takes us back, of course, to the road to serfdom, where we get the interventions 
con- basically take us from a free society to a police state. Okay. Finally, we have Money, Bank Credit and Economic Cycles by Jesus Huerta de Soto. Oh, you pronounce that better than I can. Um, again, another big monstrous book. Uh, but again, by, by this time, we're hardcore. After the, all these books so far, we're hardcore. This is a bit more of a, um, a modern take written in the last few years, written first of all in Spanish and then translated into many languages. Again, any of your investment um, listeners will love this book. You'll see this on... This was seen on the on the bookshelf of Hugh Hendry in one of his little videos that he did for Eclectic or Asset Management. You'll see those kinds of people read this kind of book. What it does is it goes through how banks got the privilege of printing money out of thin air. It goes back to Roman law, being Spanish, it, which is much more kind of Roman law influenced than us with the, the British state common law. It, it, there's a lot more of the Roman law and where the Roman laws came from and how they turned into modern European laws and about how those laws were subverted and twisted in the kind of medieval times so that banks could take your gold mm-hmm. and then lend it without your kind of permission and then lend 10 times more than you gave them without your permission and about how fractional reserve banking arose and about how then central banking arose from that to protect fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking was liked by the state, of course, because they wanted the goldsmiths and the medieval bankers to lend them money so they could fight their wars and do all the things they wanted to do for fun. Um, But of course, they had to protect the bankers and give them legal privileges to enable the bankers to keep buying their debt. So we have Henry III starting the Hundred Years' War and various other things being financed from Venice with fractional reserve banking. But then those fractional reserve bankers crashed and disappeared. So then laws were brought in in Italy to protect bankers, the Medici's and so on. Anyway, this book explains all of that and how we end up with the modern world. We end up with central banking. We end up with a lender of last resort. We end up with fiat paper money. And again, um, De Soto tries to, well, he does offer a solution at the end of the book. Again, it, it is it is a bit heavy. I will give you that. But again, it's another book that's kind of pivotal and essential if you want to become a hardcore Austrian. And again, free to download from Mises.org. Excellent stuff. Well, Andy, thank you very much. Uh, Hopefully, I'm actually writing a book and uh, hopefully I will finish it within the next few months. Uh, And uh, hopefully I will be putting um, a lot of these Austrian ideas into the most readable English that has ever been written. Fantastic. (laughs) And uh, and maybe I'll even make it onto your list one day. But uh, Andy Duncan, thank you very much. And I I do recommend people to read your your, um, your blog. Do you want to give out the website address of your Um, blog? Thegodthatfailed.org. Excellent. Thegodthatfailed.org. And I see you've just got a couple of notes there that you're pointing out. Did you want to... Uh, you wanted a tip Well, I just wanted books. to give people a bit of an easier time with this. There are some kind of fiction books you can read. Um, a couple of my favourites are Time Will Run Back by Henry Hazlitt. This describes um, our society in 200 years' time, a fully socialist sort of society, and then how that society manages to, to come back to kind of sense and prosperity and freedom and, and everything else. Okay. Um, Another book I really enjoy is The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein, a kind of science fiction book. It's sort of an allegory of the American Revolution. Essentially, it's a world of the future on the moon. Yeah. The people on the moon um, decide to revolt from the United Nations, as I think they're called. Yeah. And then they, they <laughs> throw off the, 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 the hand of Earth and become yeah. this kind of free private society, which is interesting. Now, you're not allowed to have any razor blades near you when you read these two books. But again, another, another couple of books you might want to read. Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. I've never read that, you know. You need to. You've got to read these things. It is, it is I must say, the characters are a little, I'm going to get shot for this, a little bit wooden, but the mm-hmm. ideas are fantastic and it all hangs together. I'm not an objectivist, which is the philosophy which Ayn Rand um, promoted with the book, but some of her ideas in her book are, are fantastic. Uh, also, of course, it's a bit miserable, I know, but 1984 by George Orwell explains where socialism and National Socialism eventually take us. Probably ties back again to the road to serfdom, that one. Um, so there, there, there's a few things you can read along the way while you're, while you're weighed down with all these big yeah. books at the end of my list. All right, I'm going to read uh, Sword of Thrones first, though. OK. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Andy Duncan, thanks very much for joining me, and uh, hopefully we can talk again soon in a few months. My pleasure. 
subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.